you don't have enough time to study openings, I found a system that you can use with black against pretty much everything that your opponent can play. It's a good defense and very easy to memorize. Today, we want to take them out of their comfort zone and we want to play this move, d6. Against any move that white will play, from now on, you can just play this move. Let's say your opponent plays this. Now, you're gonna put the knight on f6, attacking actually this pawn on e4. So they're gonna defend it by playing this move. And now you can still play your king's Indian, which is g6 and bishop g7, because they play d4. And now you put the bishop on g7, and now you have your king's Indian. But if they go e4 and you play d6, and they go with d4, which is what most players are gonna do against you, they're gonna push and take the center like this, because they're gonna be controlling so many squares. What I want you to do, is put the knight on f6, attacking this pawn again. This is the same formation that you are using. If you are scared about this move, that they push in the center, this is actually a very bad move, but I'm gonna show you in a bit how to win with black after this move, if they push in the center. Most people you play against are simply gonna see this pawn that is being attacked, and they're gonna defend it by playing this move. And here you're gonna play c6. It can look strange at first to actually play this move because this is taking the natural square of the knight, but this pawn controls very important square, which means the knight cannot come here, the bishop cannot come to this square as well. And also this move allows you to open the line to be able to develop your queen next. Let me show you, most people will play this move to develop their pieces to be able to, you know, castle very quickly. And here you're gonna put the queen out. And I know that some of you may think that, you know, you shouldn't put the queen out early in the game. But here, the reason why we put the queen is that we are pinning the knight. He has a direct reason, which means if your opponent is not careful and he plays very fast, especially on blitz on chess.com, for instance, and he plays this move, well, he loses a pawn on the spot because this knight is pinned. You're totally winning already with black. But what if he defends actually this pawn? So now you cannot take on e4 anymore. But the idea of this move wasn't to just pin the knight. We also eye this square with the queen. So we have a sort of double attack, I would say, which allows you to control the center by pushing this pawn. So now with this pawn, either he takes, that's the first option that he has, or he can castle, because pushing the pawn doesn't work, because you are controlling actually this square many times, which means he cannot push. The other option that he would have here is to just castle and try to finish his development. You have to remember something. This queen, when it gets attacked or the, he puts the bishop here, this queen will always come back to this square. Here you can simply develop your bishop, trying to finish your development on the king side. Let's say he puts the rook here. And now we take care of the queen side, all these pieces that are not developed. So you're gonna put the bishop, I like to put it on g4 because you're creating a pin. So now you have a direct threat, which is taking this pawn. He wouldn't be able to actually take it back because you would win the queen. So he has to do something about it. Either he exchanges or he puts the bishop here, defend the pawn on d4. You simply continue your development. You can simply castle. And when he plays a move like this, you have two options. Either you take the knight or you go back. I like to actually take the knight here because this knight is quite powerful controlling important squares and the fact that this pawn is on a white square, it restricts the space for this bishop. It's not a very good bishop, so we exchange it because when he takes, now you can take in the center. When the bishop takes, you simply take care, like we said, of the pieces on the queen side. So you develop your knight. This knight is very important here because he controls this square which means he cannot push because we're controlling it too many times. Now, if he tries to bring the knight, you know, to these squares, for instance, you just bring your rooks in the center of the game and you finish your development like this. So the next move is gonna be this because we wanna put pressure actually on the pawn. This is called a semi-open file, right? Um, it's a semi-open file because it's not an open file because he still has a pawn here, but you don't have a pawn on this file. That's the reason why we call this a semi-open file. And then at some point, the knight can come here to come to g6, controlling these two squares with a very, very solid position. Let me show you how it goes. 
If he puts the rook here, you come on f8. He puts the knight on g3, you put yours on g6. And you have a solid position. You're controlling with this knight important squares in the center. Next, this rook should come in the center. And then you're going to try to push the pawns. But let's go back for a minute and see what happens. Let's go back. If after e4, like we said, when he pushes e4, from now on, you're going to do this. The reason why you don't put your knight first out is because it's the Alekhine defense. You can, but it's a lot more dangerous to play for black. And you have a lot of variations to know because your opponent can do this and bothering your knight that you have to move again. Then he can also bother you. Then you have to move again. Then he takes the center like this and you just move the knight three times. I don't recommend this when you're starting chess. I don't think that putting the knight here makes sense. And that's the reason why you put the, the pawn on d6 because you are controlling this. And when he pushes, now you can put the knight. And now I told you that there was a trap because he can push. But if he pushes, he's lost. Because what you're going to do, you're going to take in the center. But when he takes back, it opens up this file now, which allows you with the queen to take the other queen. Now this king can never castle. And when he takes back, you have a double attack. You put the knight on g4 and you're attacking two pawns that he cannot defend. And if you think that he can just push this one here, protecting this one, now he loses because of the fork. This way, losing a rook. So you see that pushing in the center straight away is not a threat. So most people, I would say 90% people, actually decide to play this move knight c3. Because you are attacking this pawn, they're defending it. And now you're going to play always the same move, c6. They go knight f3, you go queen a5. And the point is you want this push so you can develop your pieces and then you can castle. If your opponent totally forgets after this move that you're attacking this, you're winning a pawn like this because this one is totally pinned. Remember this. If he plays a move like bishop d2, now this knight is not pinned and we don't like having actually, you know, this bishop, a possible discovery on the, on the queen. Always, you're going to bring your queen to this square. And yes, okay, you went to a5 and then you came back. But this is fine because he also has his bishop that is totally misplaced here. So he will have to put it somewhere. He will have to move it as well and lose the tempo as well by putting it here or here. And this is fine. The queen here is still eyeing this square because we want to be pushing at some point. For instance, if he plays a move like bishop c4 here, you have two options. You can push here if you want to, but you can also push on b5. You can attack his bishop straight away. If he puts his bishop here, you can use the fact that, yes, this knight is protecting this pawn, but what you're going to do, you're going to attack the bishop first. When the bishop moves, you keep pushing. And now you're asking a question to this one. And if this one has to move, it means that this pawn won't be protected anymore. If, let's say, he plays a move like knight e2, now you're taking in the center and you you're totally winning. I mean, I know it's not easy to win at this point, but you took a pawn in the center, which is which was a very important pawn. And then you're just going to continue your development like this. The bishop will come here and you will castle. This bishop will most likely come in this amazing diagonal. This knight will come here. What happens if he plays d4 now? Can you play this move d6? Yes, you can. If he plays a move like c4, you go again with the same move, knight f6. He develops his knight because he couldn't push straight away, right? Here he couldn't do this move because you would still take the pawn. So instead, he has to protect this square to be able to push. And now you can play the King's Indian if you want to, if you're a King's Indian player. Or you can still play the same system. You can decide to play this. And the queen comes on a5 if you want to. You are threatening exactly the same thing with taking here. So most likely he comes and defends it by playing bishop d3. So the point of showing you this variation today is that you can play it against everything. And you will see after that you can also play against the English opening. Because now you can play e5. It's always the same moves. I show you this because you have more chances of actually remembering it. And then you can build from there and look at other variations from this type of position, which is putting the queen here having this formation of pawns and the knight here. Now you're threatening actually to take this pawn. 
If he pushes, what you have to do is you have to put the knight on a6. The reason why you do this is that now you have an amazing square on c5. If he plays a move like this, you remember, we just go away. Here, we always come back to this square. Like in the other, other models, he develops the knight because he wants to castle. You do the same. When he castles, you simply do the same. So you continue actually the development on your king side. Now your king side is totally developed. The only issue I would say that you have in this position is, is this bishop. But this bishop most of the time is going to go here because, you know, you're going to be able to push pawns and this bishop will be quite important just on d7. If he moves the knight here, what you're going to do is simply bishop d7 or bishop g4. It's up to you. You can, you can decide to play bishop g4. Here, playing this move is weakening the dark squares, as you can see here. It's kind of weakening, and that's the reason why we played this move, because we can simply come back. But now this pawn move is actually more a weakness for him. And you will play at this position with putting the knight. Let me show you how you put your pieces. The knight is going to come here. Then you're going to bring the rook here, and you're going to try to push basically your pawns on the queen side. But let me show you if you're a King's Indian player now, okay, and you go d6, he goes c4, you go knight f6, he goes knight c3 because he wants to push, remember? Now you go g6, and he goes with e4. You develop your bishop because you want to be able to castle next. Now he has a lot of options to choose from though, because he can go with knight f3, which is the classical variation, but he can also go with a move like bishop e2, and the next move will be bishop g5, which is called the Averbach variation, which is quite tactical, actually. He can also decide to play the Semish variation by playing this move. So he's protecting the center. And this move, he's playing this move because he wants to be playing, pushing his pawns like this and attacking you on the king side. <clears throat> and also you can never actually develop your bishop. And he can also def decide to play the four pawns variation, which is quite intimidating especially if you're at beginner level because you're like he has this wall of pawns and i don't know what to do with it but the only thing you can do here here you shouldn't worry you can either castle in this situation and when he develops his knight you go with c5 you always try to break in the center to break his pawn center you don't leave his pawn center intact you always try to attack it the reason is first of all if he takes there is a trick here because we do not take back. First, you put the queen here because you are pinning this one. And it means that on the next move, you are trying to take the pawn in the center. If he takes here, that's a big blunder because now you're gonna take on e4. He cannot take back, remember? Because there is a pin. What if he takes here? You're thinking that you're in a tough spot, but there is some tactical variation here. You will take the knight. He will take, this is a check. So he has to take. And now you simply play this move, rook e8. You see that this king is very exposed. You're also threatening to actually take with a possible fork. If he tries to defend the pawn by playing this move and he's defending the pawn, you simply take here. And now there is a possible discovery. The king is in a very, very big trouble here. Even playing a move like bishop e2 is totally losing. You can just take with the knight and you're putting pressure, you're threatening already to win the game and having, having a fork between the king and the queen. So it's a tough spot and it's totally winning for black, which means, let's go back a bit, which means he couldn't take the pawn on d6. So when you put the queen out, he cannot take here because he doesn't have time because of this move. The best move in this position is to just unpin yourself. So now you cannot take here anymore. But what you can do now that your queen is out, the other idea that you had is that now you can take this pawn. You can take the pawn back this way and you're controlling an amazing diagonal. All these dark squares, all these dark squares that are very weak. And the position is totally equal already for black. He can develop his bishop, but you see that he cannot, he cannot castle because of this queen. So all you have to do is develop your pieces. The bishop is going to come here. And then you're going to bring the rooks and you're going to push in the center your pawns and blow open the center, basically. It's going to be very, very difficult for him to do something about it. So this was against the four pawns. What if he plays the Semish variation? If he plays the Semish, you castle. And most people you play against will either put their bishop on g5 
or they will put it on E3 here. So let's see what happens if they put it here. You're always going to play the same move, and this is C6. This is most likely a move that you don't know, that very few people are playing, and this is a pawn sacrifice that is coming. They're going to put their queen here because their plan is very simple. They want to put the bishop here, get rid of your bishop here. Once you don't have this defender, this bishop is super important to actually defend the king. By the way, that's the reason why we put the bishop in, in Fianchetto is because it controls very important squares around the king. So what they want, they want to get rid of this bishop and then they're going to start pushing their pawns and take this one. So this rook will have a column that is open and they will be able to attack you. Just think about something. When the bishop is not here anymore, because it got exchanged against this one, like this, it means that nobody, just put it in your mind that these two bishops are not here. Now this queen can infiltrate here once he goes like this and opens the, opens the, the column. So what do we do when our opponent is trying to attack us on the side of the board? We counter in the center. So after his move, we go straight away with this move, which can seem a little bit weird at first because he's going to take, take, and now he's going to push, asking a question to this one. And you're thinking the first move, okay, don't make the mistake to do this. You would lose after this move because the knight doesn't have any square anymore. All squares are gone, so... Next move, he's going to take your knight. So you do not want to go there. Most people will put their knight here, but I find the position of the knight, as you can see, especially with the pawn here that is controlling these two squares. Th where is this knight going next? I mean, it's just ugly looking. Instead, I want you to play this move, which can seem so weird because it means that this one is not protected and you're going to lose a pawn. But in this situation, you're going to play knight c6. You are giving the pawn in the center, but you will have great activity for your pieces. Let's say most people will play this move in this situation. Now you will go with knight a5. You're directly attacking the pieces of your opponent. If he goes bishop d3, already you have this move. You take, because look at this, there was a discovery possible, right? So if the knight goes, yes, you lose the knight, but you're going to take his knight against it. So you got your pawn back with an amazing position because you're going to bring the rook here. You're going to have pressure along the file. He also has a problem with this pawn now because, you know, you're attacking it twice. He can defend his pawn this way, but now you go with knight c4 and you get the bishop pair. He has to give you the bishop pair. So he has to take because you are attacking. He has to give you, you're attacking this, you're attacking this. The bishop is going to take, and you take with the queen. And as you can see here, you have an amazing position where you are controlling so many lines with your queen. Also, this bishop is going to become a monster here. You're going to bring the rooks on open files. His king is still in the center, and he's going to feel the heat very quickly here. This is if your opponent was playing this move, bishop c4. Most people here, they're going to go back with their knight because they don't like having a knight actually in the center that is unprotected. And here, you're going to put your queen out on a5, putting some sort of pressure here. The idea is you want to put your queen there because you freed this square, which means the rook will be able, the rook will be able to come here, putting pressure along this, along this file. If, for instance, he goes with f4, now you're going to go knight b6. Look how this knight is controlling very important squares in the center. By giving this pawn on d5, what you did is that you opened actually the lines for your pieces. You know, you will also have ideas with f6 to blow up the center like this. For instance, he goes, to, he goes with a normal move, which is developing his knight to f3. You're just going to develop your bishop here. Now you have a grip on this square, as you can see. Both are controlling the square. You're also you're controlling d5 and c4. And that's the reason why it's hard to play for white, is that you have a lot of activity with your pieces. It's quite nice to play. You gave a pawn, yes, but this position is really not easy to play. If he goes with bishop e2 to try and castle, for instance, now you go with knight c4. Right on time. You're attacking the queen, attacking the bishop. 
he has to take. Losing this dark square bishop that is protecting actually these important pawns would be a disaster for white. That's the reason why he has to take. And you take with the bishop. And now what it does is that he cannot castle. You see that you gave a pawn in the center, but you have a lot of counterplay. If he pushes here to try and attack your king, all you have to do is just block him like this, controlling this square. Now he will understand that he has to put the king safe, for instance, and you go with the knight. You are threatening moves like this, threatening to go on d5, the rooks are going to come here, and you're going to have an amazing play. Now the main line, which is knight f3. On this, you're always going to castle. 99% players just play bishop e2 because they want to they wanna castle. And now you're ready to attack in the center. Now, you may think that you're giving this pawn, but you're not. Because if they take, you take back. And let's say they exchange queens. You exchange the queens. And now you're thinking, okay, I'm losing this pawn, but you're not. Because there is a discovery on the knight. You can simply take their pawn. Because when they take the knight, you take theirs. So all you did, you can count the pawns if you want. All you did is just exchanging pieces and pawns. <clears throat> just because you had the discovery like this that you, you need to know. Which means that taking the pawn in the center after this move, this pawn is not hanging because there will be a discovery. The two main line here is either to push, which is the Petrosian variation, or the modern way to play is to castle, and most people these days are just castling. So we're going to analyze this. Now I want you to take in the center. They're going to take, obviously, they have to take with the knight. If they take with the queen, you know what to do. You're just going to put the rook here. And on the next move, you're threatening this. Because the queen is misplaced, the bishop would be attacking the queen. After you take, most people are just going to take and have an amazing trap here. Because now you're going to attack the pawn. You're threatening with these two pieces to take the pawn. They have to defend it. Most people defend it this way. Now develop the knight. Putting pressure on d4. So they're going to release the pressure by putting their bishop that supports the knight. Now move this knight and put it on the side of the board. And there is a, a tactical idea behind it. And you're going to lose so many games. You have no idea how many games I win like this. They're going to put the queen on d2, which is the main move. Now we're ready. Take on d4. When they take back, I don't want you to take and just exchange pieces. You're going to play this amazing move, knight f4. Now you're thinking, okay, the queen can take the knight. But if the queen takes, it means that you can take the bishop that is not protected anymore and you, you would have all the dark squares. Instead, what they do is that they take the bishop straight away, especially in blitz very fast thinking that you're going to take and then they're going to take your knight and their piece up but that's not the case once they take your bishop we're not taking back we're playing this move and most people resign here because they understand there is a threat of checkmate in one move but if they defend it let's say by pushing now you have a discovery attack on the queen just by checking the king he has to move and you win the queen so you see, most people don't know that there is a defense here. They are actually re resigning here just because there is a defense and the defense is to put king f2. It's really hard to find. The reason is that when you check, there is a discovery, yes, but the king comes here and he's protecting his queen, which means that this move is not good. Instead, if they do this, all you have to do, and they found this move, I mean, most people, especially at your level, will resign before finding the king move. Very few people will find this. If they do, sorry, if they do, and they play this, all you have to do is take the bishop back. Now your knight is protected by the queen, so you're fine. And if they start playing moves like this, they lose, for instance, because there is this check. And they have only one square which is e1. And now you check. They only have one square to go to, and there is a nice fork. You're forking and winning this rook. I can show you again against the English opening. You can also play d6. Most people will play knight c3. Now I want you to go with e5 straight away. Because you can, because they didn't, push a, they didn't put a pawn in the center that can take. So if we can do it, why not taking the center? And you're going to develop the same way. 
most people will go d3, and here you're going to go c6. Exactly the same thing, controlling these two important squares. Most people will go with g3, and here you start developing exactly the same way. The knight comes here, the bishop here, and you castle. And one day, you will be pushing in the center if you can. Here they're going to put the bishop, they're going to develop their bishop. You do exactly the same thing. And if they go with knight f3, you just castle. It's a very solid system that you can play against pretty much everything. Here most people will play this move. And now you have a lot of options. But you can decide to push here if you like close positions, for instance, because you can decide to play this. And the idea is to put a knight here and then having control of this square. If you don't like to close the, the, the center like this, what you can do here is that you can play this move. And then you're going to be attacking with this. Everything that will happen here will be these pawns that will advance at some point to blow up the center. This is how you're going to do. This bishop is going to go either on g4 or you can put it on e6. If you put it here, you have to be careful. For instance, if you, instead of this move, you cannot play bishop e6 straight away because they bother us with this move and trying to have us actually to have double pawns in the center. So what you can do instead is if you want to put your bishop here, you can just play a move like this. Now, these two pieces cannot come on g5. And then you can put your bishop here. But you can play this system that is really flexible. So this knight, this bishop is going to go here. This knight is going to come here. You're going to push the pawns like this. The rooks are going to come in the center. The queen is going to come here. And this is how you're going to play against the, against the English. You now have a system that you should go and try on chess.com and let me know how it goes.